Hello, everybody. Welcome to what I call my mini lecture in my elementary soil mechanics class. Uh, this is a lecture that I focus solely on um, theory behind predicting fluid flow through soils. There's only a few slides in here, and it's because I only focus on theory. But I do this because I want to separate the theory from the actual practice and getting your hands dirty. So uh, in these few short slides, we're going to discuss how we can derive what are called the continuity and the Laplace equations to predict seepage and flow and lots of other useful things through soil um, that we'll talk about in the next lecture, which deals with flow nets. So by way of introduction, we, we've been discussing Darcy's Law and how we use it to compute the seepage of water through soil, or namely the flow or velocity of water through soil. And this is great if we have problems that have really simple geometries and boundary conditions like pipes filled with soil or, or containers where soil is flowing um, from one upper chamber to a lower chamber. Here, but here's the problem. In, in the real world, um, the problems really aren't that simple. Uh, we have all sorts of different configurations. We rarely have confining boundaries like pipes. You know, no one puts soil inside of pipes. That's just something we do for homework problems. Rarely do we know the distribution of the total head through the soil mass. And that's a hard problem because without that understanding or that knowledge, we can't really predict what the flow is of the fluid through the soil mass. Now, if we know the boundary conditions, or in other words, if we know what the water levels are upstream of our soil and downstream of our soil, say we have like a dam, then we can use the law of conservation of mass. And, and another way to think of this is what goes in must come out. We can use that law with a differential equation to solve or find an equation for the head distribution through the soil. Now I know that this sounds Greek to you, but um, let's see if we can explain it a little bit better. So let's consider, for instance, some cube of soil. I have this shown right here. And um, the soil, we're going to say, is infinite in this direction. So we're going to ignore flow in and out of that direction because we're going to say that the, the soil or the water cannot flow in that direction because of its infinity. Okay, But if we have flow coming into the soil, so that's going to be the velocity of the flow times the change in the z direction times the change in the y direction. So that's basically just an area. So velocity, you know, all of these are just going to be velocity times area, which is a flow. Okay, so that's our flow in. And that's got to be equal to the flow out plus any change in the um, flow as it relates, uh, or any change in the velocity relative to the change in displacement as we move through the x direction. And it's got to be the same in the z direction as well. So the flow in, in the z direction, has got to equal the flow out uh, plus any change in the flow that occurred within our soil cube. So, okay, we're starting to develop some um, equations here that can explain the behavior that we have. Now, let's combine all these equations, and we're going to do the law of conservation of mass. So remember, this is the, the here on the left side, this is the flow out from our cube. And the flow out minus the flow in, that was what's here on the right side, has got to equal zero. There, there can be no change because otherwise we'd be making mass magically appear or disappear, which is impossible. So now we have this big, nasty differential equation. We can make it easy on ourselves and say, well, we can solve and satisfy this equation if, first of all, the change in the velocity relative to x and the change in the velocity relative to z as we move the, the soil through the cube is going to be equal to 0. And in other words, there's 
nothing that's going to be happening within the soil itself that's going to speed up the, the velocity. Now, you may be saying, wait a minute. I thought in the previous lecture you said that when water starts to flow through soil, its velocity speeds up because the area through which it flows um, diminishes considerably. That is true. But remember that the, we're assuming that the flow coming in or the velocity of the flow coming in is already coming through soil. Remember, this is just a cube we pulled out of a big infinite soil system. So we're, we're going to assume then that there's nothing that happens within our little sample cube that's going to cause the velocity to change with distance. That's our first assumption. All right, so if that's the case then, we're going to substitute in Darcy's law, meaning, remember, Darcy's law is velocity equals hydraulic conductivity times hydraulic gradient. And hydraulic gradient um, is just the change in head over the change in length. Well, isn't this basically the same thing as the change in head over the change in x, or the change in head over the change in z? Yeah, basically it is. And we have the negative sign just to capture the fact that um, we're losing head um, as the water flows through the soil, not gaining it. So if that's the case, then we can rewrite this equation up top, the conservation of mass equation, as this right here. Okay, so now we have a x conductivity term and we have a z conductivity term. Here's the second big assumption. If we assume that the soil behaves isotropically, in other words, that the conductivity in the horizontal direction is equal to the conductivity in the vertical direction, then we can cancel those k's out. And we're left with this. Um, it looks complicated, but it's not that complicated. It's just a, a essentially a second derivative equation that relates the total head to our location x and our location z in our soil mass and that the change in the head um, relative to the change in its location has got to be equal to zero. So in other words we, we made two big assumptions. I want to review these. The first assumption is we assume that there's no change in the velocity in our soil mass. The second and the big assumption is we're assuming that the soil is isotropic and that the conductivity in the horizontal direction is the same as the conductivity in the vertical direction. When we do that and we develop this equation, it has a name. It's called the Laplace equation. The Laplace equation is a famous equation that multiple engineering disciplines use to describe how the energy of a fluid changes as it flows through various media. <coughs> oh, bless me. I'm sorry. Now, the interesting thing about the Laplace equation is that it's independent of hydraulic conductivity. It does not matter if we have fluid flow through a clay that has a really low conductivity or if we have fluid flow through a gravel that has a really high conductivity. It's independent of hydraulic conductivity and that's because of our isotropic assumption. So if we take the Laplace equation then, we could solve it for instance, and, and say that I'm interested in, you know, some value of h. h equals, I don't know, we'll just call it uh, uh, y star or something like that. This is just a value, uh, any number that I'm interested in. I could take this differential equation and I could solve for every combination of x and z that would give me y star. Now remember, x and z are simply geometric coordinates on a grid. So in other words, um, let's pull up our whiteboard from before. If I have just some cross-section of soil, we might have a coordinate system. 
where this is x and this is z. So anywhere in this cross section of soil, maybe it's right there, then you know this value here is going to be x1 and this value right here is going to be z1 or maybe I'm interested in this point right here. So that might be x2 and this z value might be z2. The point is that every point in our soil system has a, an x z coordinate. And so I could solve or use a Laplace equation to solve for every xz coordinate combination that would have y star as its total head. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say if I were to put down a piezometer to my point number one, water is going to rise up inside of that piezometer. It's going to rise up to some level. And let's say that we have a datum. So let's say, you know, I'm interested in um, that head of Y star, whatever that number is. I could find every point in this soil system where if I were to stick a piezometer down, the water would rise up to a value of Y star in that piezometer. That's what I'm saying. So then, because H is constant and we solve for the X and Z values, now once we have those points, if we connect them with a line, we can call that line, or we do call that line, an equipotential line. Equa means it's the same, and potential means it's referring to its energy potential. So it's the same energy potential. Or in other words, the water would rise up in the piezometer the same height. If we chose a different value of head, say, I don't know, x star. No, wait, I've got x already. So let's just say m star. It's just, it's a number. A different value of h will produce a different equipotential line. So if I'm looking, for instance, at this figure down here, this line right here that's dashed is an equipotential line. And what that means is that if I were to put a piezometer down to that point, wherever that line is, the water in that piezometer rises up to the exact same value in that piezometer. So if I were to put a piezometer here down to that line and stop it right there, the water would rise up, guess where? Yeah, to that exact same point. Now what if I put a piezometer down to this point right here that I'm coloring in? How high would the water rise up? I don't know, but I can tell you it won't be to this level because this point right here is not on that equipotential line. And so the water would rise up to a different level if I put a piezometer down to that point. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about equipotential lines, there's an inverse function of the Laplace equation that we can solve that gives us what's called a stream function. And this is kind of like, think of it like the cousin of the equipotential line or the equipotential function. The stream function gives us the path that a drop of water would take through the soil system. So this line right here represents the stream function. Or a more common name that we like to call these lines are called flow, whoops, they're called flow lines. And that's an appropriate name because it represents the path that this drop of water right here would take to get out and exit uh, the system over here. So like equipotential lines, we mathematically can solve for all the xz coordinates that correspond to a given flow line. And there's a couple of things we know. These flow lines or these stream functions, they are always orthogonal to the head function or the equipotential line. They're 
always orthogonal, meaning right at the point of intersection, they intersect at 90 degrees. So, given um, that information, if we determine the location of multiple equipotential or headlines and multiple flow lines, then we've developed what's called a flow net. A flow net is useful because think of it as a contour. Oops, I can't spell. Think of it as a contour map for piezometric head. From which we can get pressure, pore pressure of the water, or we can get velocity of the water we can get hydraulic gradient of, of the flow in the soil and, and a whole bunch of other things that we'll talk about in the next lecture. But what I just want to introduce you to the idea is that engineers are going to use flow nets to be able to predict or know where uh, or what the total energy is at any point in a fluid flow system problem. Now, engineers used to draw these flow nets by hand, but um, you can imagine that that can be kind of painful. Um, even though, as you'll see in the next lecture, when we talk about flow nets, that there are some techniques that really make it kind of convenient and in a, in a sick sort of way, kind of fun. Um, today, engineers are going to use computers to directly solve the Laplace equation, either using finite difference approximations or um, precise finite element mathematical solutions. And so, you know, in engineering practice today, people draw flow nets digitally with computers, but next week you're going to do it by hand. So that's the end of this mini lecture. Um, I can't wait to talk about flow nets. So go ahead and click on the next lecture to move into the flow net topic, and we'll get you started on it. Thanks for your attention, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day.